then. And we're live. All right, excellent. So having not prepared much, uh, let's see, on the fly. Um, so let's talk about DevOps in general, where we've come the last uh, year, uh, where we're going, and then talk specifically about auto DevOps, and then open it up from there. How does that sound? That works. All right, cool. Um, well, I think I already showed you this last time. Uh, the but it's a good place to start. Let's see, I'm gonna pull up our direction page and then I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, okay, so from the direction page. Um, this was uh, when I joined a year or so ago. Um, I created a, a vision document for CI/CD um, and uh, outlined, you know, a lot of the, the key things that you know I thought were, were missing in CI/CD in general, and going beyond CD is the is CD. You know, we had I just called it Beyond CD, literally. That's what I called it because I didn't have a name for it. Um, and I created this uh, example pipeline to sort of characterize all the stuff. I move this. Is this going to work? Okay, good. Um, and so I mentioned this before, but the reason I love this diagram is not only because it's complex and scary, but also because when I started, we had maybe four boxes filled in, and now we've got uh, ten or whatever it is um, filled in, or twelve or whatever. Um, you know, basically, we originally had obviously the code management. Can you actually see my mouse, or is it? We can. OK, good. Um, so yeah, we had code management, and then obviously build and tests. And, uh, and we kind of did deploy, but not really. Well, since then, we've added review apps, which is really awesome. It's a specific example of deploys. But we also added you know, a more formalized mechanism for doing deploys and actually reporting deploys and deploy histories and keeping track of environments and everything else. And we added canary deploys in 9.2. Um, we added code climate in, I think, in 9.3, or maybe it was 9.2 even that slipped in. I'm not sure. Um, but it was just recent. Um, we added Prometheus monitoring at a system level, I think, in 9.0 or somewhere around there. Uh, we don't yet have what I call the business monitoring, um, which really is just other things other than the system, you know, so revenue or clicks or whatever you care about. And that's coming though. Uh, we don't yet have a plan for feature flags, but I think it's a really important part. Um, we have a plan for load testing. Um, the Prometheus team is actually leading that, uh, although there might be some things that are Prometheus related, but nonetheless, load testing is a first class thing. And then down here, we have this other sort of dimension of pipelines, which is a relationship of different code, code basis projects. And in 9.3, we're gonna introduce the first um, versions of cross-project pipelines. So really going from you know, a, a core thing of three boxes, actually, um, to, uh, to whatever, 90% of this is complete. Um, so that's pretty awesome. What also became obvious then, it, to me at least, is that as we were looking at this, you know, I used to kind of think of this as a hard line, uh, developer-focused versus ops-focused, and uh, thinking like, oh yeah, we'll get you like, up into the point, we'll deploy it into production, and we might even watch the metrics related to your code in production. We're not going to just monitor your production app. Like, that's operations. That's clearly out of scope, right? And what kind of hit me a few months ago is, why is that out of scope? That's ridiculous. No, we're going to keep going. We're going to go back, you know, past production into operations. And most of the still st stuff still applies, but it goes further and says, okay, well, not only am I going to be monitoring the system just as it relates to merge requests, what about monitoring the system for network errors, outages, whatever, dependency problems, whatever, anything that is typically ops related that may or may not involve a developer at all. I mean, some things are just like literally, oh, this is a network operating system, whatever. Um, something went wrong and it's got nothing to do with code. Well, in the broad sense code, but not your code, your project code. Um, and you know Amazon is down. We've got to reroute to Google. Whatever the heck, there's real operation stuff, and it really hit me that we really need to to get towards that. We need to go beyond that 
And then that gave a little bit more of context for, um, oops, my duck. Uh, no, there. Um, for, you know, this thing that I was calling beyond CD, well, you know, maybe that's really just DevOps. So maybe the whole thing is DevOps. I'm sort of really bring, bring the question of, is there a better way to describe this stuff? Um, I'll start with a little bit of meta here about DevOps. Um, DevOps is, is hard to define because everybody defines it slightly differently. But in particular, um, there's two things that we sort of got to keep in mind. One is that sometimes people define DevOps as the intersection. So I actually look up uh, Wikipedia. Um, There's this little triangle here, or sorry, uh, Venn diagram with a little triangle in the middle. And it's like, oh, well, DevOps is the intersection of development, operations, and QA, which is already confusing because like, it's not DevOps, QA, it's DevOps. Why isn't it just the intersection of the two? But it makes sense nonetheless, because um, actually a lot of this has to do with reliability of your code and continuous integration and all this kind of stuff. But so here, DevOps is defined as this, um, as this, the intersection. So there's implying that there's other things that developers do that aren't related to DevOps, that operations do that aren't related to DevOps. And that makes sense until you then look at this, this DevOps toolchain definition, where they basically say everything from code to releasing to monitoring, that's all the DevOps toolchain. And so then it's like, well, that's everything. That's not the intersection, that's the union of everything. And so I think that's where things get a little confusing when we talk about DevOps. Um, a long time ago, Hayden challenged me and said, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think GitLab is is you know the it's the DevOps tool chain. Back then, I was like, no, wait a minute, we don't do opsy stuff. We're we're like the dev part of that, and you know, we're, we're it's way too early to do ops. Well, that's not true anymore. We are absolutely part of the DevOps tool chain. We do a complete DevOps tool chain, is what I say. Um, we cover from code to monitoring, and I I, sh I shouldn't actually say complete. It, we have a tool chain of which you still probably are going to have other components. We're not everything in your tool chain. We don't do Kubernetes. Like there's still parts of your DevOps tool chain you need, but we are a complete thing in the sense of end to end from code to production to monitoring. Um, and we do something in that entire spectrum. So from the tool chain tool product description, you can say, well, then DevOps means code control, building, testing, packaging, et cetera. But you know that means that everything, the, the, everything that we do, everything that every, you know, a lot of folks do in this whole developer cycle and the whole ops cycle, that's all DevOps. So then again, you get to this nomenclature thing of like, all right, well, but when we usually talk about DevOps, we're not talking about all of your code stuff. It's it's the intersection parts that are the interesting parts of DevOps. It's the parts where we let developers get their code into production easily. That slice, that intersection. Um, you know, in the Venn diagram again, that's the, the interesting part about DevOps. Having said that though, still as a product company, we are going to deliver things that are pretty squarely in the development side. And eventually we're gonna hopefully deliver things that are pretty squarely in the operations side, where at some point we may have an operations dashboard that lets you understand your dependencies of your network infrastructure and your routers and your whatever. And, that's pretty far-fetched at this point, but it could happen. Like, why not just have this be your one operations dashboard? And then it's not just about the intersection of DevOps. It's the whole DevOps tool chain. So anyway, at least just to get on the same page, um, those are the two sort of definitions of DevOps that I think are really interesting here. Um, for the most part, my personal interest has been in the intersection pieces. Um, you know, it's the stuff where you know, we do great code management. We've done that for quite a while. How do we get that code into production? How do we get it into, back into QA? And the DevOps is a great example. That is squarely in that, you know, tiny little triangle in the middle. It's, you know, you need, you get your code, you deploy it, which is an operations thing, but you have it deployed in a temporary ephemeral app just for QA people. QA people could be designers or product managers or whoever, um, but people who are not just the, the primary coders. And that they can actually quality assurance, you know, uh, or feature assurance, or whatever, just otherwise test your application. And so that's you know squarely in that little triangle. Um, so that is whirlwind, high level, um, sort of where we've been, and a little bit about where we're going. Um, 
there's uh, there are a few issues that we're tracking. Oh, I'm going to pull up a few of these because we can refer to them later. Uh, DevOps dashboard. All right, let's start with that. Um, there's this big meta thing about ops features that I created uh, well, a really month ago now. Um, as we started to look into like, oh, we've got this monitoring dashboard, but it's still very developer centric. Well, what about taking that same content and slicing it from the operator's perspective? Um, and so we get uh, some of these, this ops view of monitoring and deploy boards. This is pretty hard to understand because it's um, intentionally convoluted to show you the complexity of the thing. But the idea is that as an ops person, I might have an overview for a moment, ignore all this stuff below. Let's just pretend there's only four things. And it's just a really high level. What's the state of my production? You know, and thinking about it, like from a developer, I can go into a project, I can then go into the environments and I can look at, or sorry, first, yeah, into a project, into the environments, see the production environment for that project. I can see what the status is. But what if I want to see all production environments? You know, um, as an operations person, I care a little less about the projects and I care about production. How is production? And so think about this as giving me the overview of production. Um, and so all of these little boxes would represent production deploys of projects that you have in your GitLab infrastructure. And again, it's explicitly convoluted because we had just introduced um, subgroups and I wanted to make sure that this mechanism expanded. So even if you look at this and you just ignore all this stuff below and say, all right, well, here's all these top level dashboards. And then here's like one level down. Um, which is already still pretty complicated, but let's say, you know, your marketing organization had different properties than your other developer operations, whatever. And you'd be able to really quickly, you know, see what the status is. And if something's red, you'd be able to click down and see stuff. Um, and, you know, you'd be able to see graphs like this, which again, we already provide, but from the other angle where you're looking at it from a project perspective or as a developer, I'm looking at a deploy and saying, oh, how did my deploy affect my performance? But this is going the other way around and saying, how's production? And you know, how is anything wrong with you know my entire production suite or whatever? So this is actually really just sort of scratching the surface of ops views of things. But um, but I think it's going to be really more, much, much more important as people you know embrace DevOps and you want to be talking the same language as your you know, your developers want to be talking the same language as your operations people or Frankly, in a lot of organizations, it's really the same people. Um, there are no separate operations people. Developers push code to production, and they're paged if something goes wrong. Um, I've worked in that environment where we basically disbanded ops, um, and it was awesome and incredibly hard in some ways. It was a hard transition, but DevOps also totally different dimension, but it has multiple definitions there. Like, is DevOps, you know, the the developers and the operators? Or is it one person now fulfilling two roles? At any rate, either way, you want to be using the same tools and you want to be able to point to, you know, a whatever, a memory bump here, for example, and your operations people should be able to see that same memory bump. But if they're using completely different tools, they're using New Relic and Datadog and whatever, that kind of sucks. So let's give them the same tools. Um, this is just a slightly different view, uh, actually, of kind of our existing environmental stuff, but just merging the stuff a little bit better so you can actually see the health of each pod. Um, this is more another sort of ops view thing where, you know, um, there's multiple pods running your production environment. You don't, there's no single memory usage. There's an average usage or a max usage, but there's lots of different pods all with their own little memory usages. Um, and in fact, there could be like one pod that has some, you know, egregious amount of memory or GPU or something because something's wrong. And, you know, that's, going a little farther than we've really planned right now, but the idea of like digging into pod health and all this kind of stuff, but that will come. Um, let's see what else there is. Um, that doesn't have any pictures, so it's not good to talk about. I think there's another, let me dig into some of these, because I think some of these are awesome. Um, I particularly love this proposal, and I really want to see this happen soon, actually. So we currently have um, environments. Uh, if you haven't seen one, I'll, uh, let's see, I know I just made one. Um, uh, 
We really just gave this demo a moment ago. So this is what the environment page looks like today. It's just a list of environments with um, you know, the last deployment, which the number doesn't really mean a lot, but the, the picture might tell you who deployed, so that's good. The commit, so here I can see that it's running the same SHA as staging, which is kind of nice. I can see the deploy board, and I can see you know, that this has finished. If there was a deploy ongoing, I'd be able to see the state as this rolled out. We don't currently show you the health of these pods. Once they're deployed, that's all we know is that they are deployed. But we have discussions, at least, of how to say, like, oh, well, if a pod is failing, we can sort of. So this is all. This is how the environment's view is today. It's centered around, um, you know, sort of the deployment history. And if I click actually on, um, oh, there's nothing there. Let me click on this one. Maybe there's at least two deploys. So here, there's a history of deploys, and this is actually really valuable because um, I can see who deployed things, how long ago. So if something went wrong in production, I can see like, oh, it went around. It was two hours ago that this happened. Okay, great. Who deployed something then? It's a roundabout way of digging into that information, but at least you have it today. Um, it's also really great for uh, being a rollback really quickly. If you do find a problem in production, I can just really quickly roll back and then let developers have some space to go and figure out what went wrong, but I can at least go back to a known good configuration. But this issue turns all that same kind of information, turns it around, um, and has, frankly, more of a DevOps view of the thing. Um, the idea I take the same application, and instead of just looking at a list of environments, I'd be looking at columns. OK, that alone isn't such a big deal. This example happens to show two staging environments. Um, you can even just ignore that for simplicity and pretend there's only one. But there would be lots of review apps and you know, some number of staging environments and a production environment. What's cool about this, though, is instead of <clears throat> just showing you the SHA, we would show you <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we would show you like what merge requests have emerged into staging that are not yet in production. And that's a great sort of marriage of these two views that you'd be able to see the diff between them. Oh. Something going on here. <clears throat> All right, let's see if this works better. <clears throat> well, I'm actually losing my voice. Wow. <clears throat> oh, buddy, I don't have laryngitis. We'll see how long this lasts. Um, <clears throat> so, all right, so seeing which merge requests are there, you know, because you can already do a diff and you can look at the commits and you can look at the commit messages and stuff. But really this marries a couple of awesome pieces of information. Like we think in terms of merge requests, awesome. And I look at functionality groups of functions and say, all right, this feature has been shipped into staging, but not yet in production. This list, although it's just a mockup, it shows the exact same information, would show you maybe the last five things that were in production or what was included in the last deploy or whatever it is, whatever works best for your environment, maybe even because you know, we don't deploy that often. So showing just what's in the last deploy might be enough, but for people that deploy you know, 17 times a day, maybe that's a little less useful and you just show a history. Um, but then we also build in a little bit more of the, the operations kind of stuff um, and say, all right, well, what's the state of my pods? Um, you know, here we're, we're flagging one where error rate exceeded, you know, something, there's some alert that popped up, uh, you know, and here we're showing this automatic rollback kind of stuff, whatever. But <clears throat> basically just really building in, you know, this ops view. Of course, this is still a DevOps view in the sense that I'm looking at an individual project and looking at all this stuff. So, um, you know, one permutation of that would be what would this look like for, you know, marrying that sort of, um, the ops view of oh, all the production, where am I at? Or, or I'm looking at maybe a microservices kind of thing where there's five or a hundred different projects and I want to really quickly see the status of all those. Um, I think this one's got a mock-up. It doesn't look as impressive, frankly, because you know, it just becomes sort of a matrix of stuff. But from an ops perspective, this could be really valuable. And it just really quickly gives me, you know, the status of staging production at least. We may care a little less about review apps from an ops perspective, um, but certainly being able to see really quickly, you know, again, what's the status of my production fleet? 
um, what's queued up to go into production, what hasn't been deployed yet, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the concrete um, ideas we have. Um, I think, you know what, let's go through some of these other ones because there's some really cool ones in here too. It's all future stuff. Um, this in particular is unplanned. Um, oh, this one doesn't have, oh, there does have mockups down here. Let's go to the last mockup. Um, so here the idea is that you've deployed something in production and um, some module or whatever that you depend on has been updated, not by you, but by the community or whatever. And so we would automatically, so there's multiple levels to think about this. Um, sort of the easiest and most naive way is to say, well, on the next merge request or next CI CD run, we would go and check to see if you're testing something, you know, to see if anything's outdated. And we might fail your CI CD and say, oh, you've got an outdated version of, in this case, ES6 promise. Um, and, you know, maybe that wouldn't be a fail normally, but let's say it was a security release. And maybe like, oh, well, this failed that because you haven't updated. But that's kind of lame because it's like, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm working on something unrelated to this thing. Now you're going to fail me because something changed outside my control. That doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't it make much more sense to just run this stuff automatically? And even if, for example, nobody pushes for seven days, but in the middle of that, there's a security release of something, you should just proactively run stuff and, and notify me. So that's sort of a second iteration um, of thinking about how you would notify somebody and tell them, oh, you know, you've got a security you know, change, you should go in and do something about it. But then it's like, well, all right, now the third iteration is like, well, what would you do with that information? You'd go and maybe give it to your junior developer to go and make the change and, and point to the new version, you know, like this, you know, literally it's, oh, you know, change the, the Semver, bump it up to the next model version. And then of course you need to test that that works. So you're going to create a merge request and, um, and then test it to make sense, to make sure that it still functions properly. But like, well, why notify somebody and, and tell, you know, your junior developer to go and do this. Like, why don't we just do it for you? Why don't we just go and submit this merge request for you and then tell you what the results are. And in fact, let's go further and say, Hey, it passed. We just deployed it to production for you. Like, why would should you have, you know, a, a security vulnerability in place at all. You know, so this goes from sort of the alert kind of mindset to you go to work in the morning and you just get an email saying like, oh, production has been updated for the security release. And so even when like these really huge like open SSL security problems kick in and everybody's got to frantically scramble to fix it, like why don't we just fix that for you? Um, and of course, because you trust your CI, it would automatically deploy to production. And if it didn't, then you'd finally get the alert. You know, so instead of having an alert about a hundred projects or microservices that all need to get updated, you just get alert about three of them that fail, that actually have some weird dependency that it didn't work on. And then you can actually focus on, you know, real problems. <clears throat> so that's sort of a, a glimpse at um, how we're thinking about this. This would definitely be an enterprise level feature. Um, and again, it, we fleshed out some ideas, but it's unscheduled, um, but does really tie into the ops mindset. Um, and uh, I don't know if this has much. I think this is just talking about how we'd auto revert something. Um, hey, <clears throat> this is. Oh. I've got a quick question. Sure. So you you mentioned that 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 sort of um, automation um, would be definitely like a enterprise edition feature. Um, can you? Can you talk a little bit more about why like a smaller development team, uh, like under a hundred developers wouldn't get value out of something like that? So this is where things get a little tricky because um, yeah, of course, smaller developer teams would get value out of that too. Everybody would get value out of that. Um, some of it has to do with sort of proportionality or whatever. Um, one test I like to use is, is there some other way you can achieve the same thing using workarounds or whatever, and we're just making it easier? And that's a good case here. Like you can already do this. You can clearly manually do all this stuff, but we're gonna automate it. And automation is something that affects larger companies a lot more because they've got hundreds of projects with thousands of developers or whatever it is, and they just can't deal with the scale or, or it's worth dealing with the automation. 
Whereas if you've got a small developer with a single project, like you're pretty much on top of it. And if something changes, like, yeah, you just go ahead and, you know, you're aware of it. Um, the bigger challenges are when you're just not aware of how this thing might affect, you know, one project somewhere that you've almost forgotten about or whatever. Um, the other thing is that, well, I don't know, just to, to be blunt, that I think um, our, our concepts that Enterprise Edition is only for, you know, if you've got more than X people is a little flawed. It's that it applies more to those companies, that those people value it more, but that they'd be willing to pay for it more, however you, you, know, you judge your value there. Um, clearly, small companies would value all this automation and everything else, but they're not going to get as much incremental value out of it as a larger company would. Um, the other way to look at it is just that um, this is pretty advanced stuff. And, and frankly, it just doesn't deserve to be free open source. It's probably really complicated stuff that we're going to have to do there. Like, maybe there'd be levels to it, right? There'd be a version that says, yeah, you'll get an alert. We'll run this test once a day. Or maybe we can just have a blog post about how to do this. You set up a, um, a recurring scheduled pipeline job that once a day tests to see if any of your dependencies have been updated. And you could do that today and then it would alert you. But to automate it, to actually create the merge request for you and everything else, well, that's in the enterprise feature. Um, it's not that version checking isn't important for everybody, but the automation around it really, really matters for larger things. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the kind of the first way you, you described it and that like, you know, yeah, like everyone gets some value out of a feature like this, but the, the overwhelming kind of value and use for this is in kind of larger, um, larger development uh, teams like that, that resonated. Right, good. Um, okay, so then this is just a feature showing, um, you know, how we're thinking about uh, you know, we've got this canary deploy, and um, we have a, another f uh, feature we're not currently working on or scheduled, but is incremental rollout, so that it would not just roll out to a single canary or a bucket of canaries, but it would just slowly increment and go to 1%, then 5%, then 25%, whatever it is, increment your stuff. But let's say at some point during that rollout, you detect an error. Um, so this is a mock-up of what it would look like, and you're like, oh, you know, error rate increased by something above our threshold. Let's revert that one, go back and, and, you know, and create an issue or whatever it is, alert um, you know, somebody to take a look at it. Um, lately, I'm thinking, I don't know if I really want to automatically roll back versus like, just stop it in its canary form and say, well, it's canary. Let's let the canary be there so you can debug the canary, but just don't let the canary go on further. Um, because sometimes like error rate exceeding is a pretty tough one, but let's say memory bumps up and you might be like, yeah, we added something and it's using more memory and we're okay with that. We don't, don't stop my deploy just because it's using more memory, but there might need to be human intervention in there. But anyway, but somewhere along this line, you know, automating a lot of this deploy stuff, um, pretty cool. Um, oh, I think I already talked about this, but basically, yeah, there's no, there's no visuals, but just not just showing the status of a deploy, but just the status of each pod. So that's it um, for that ops features stuff. Um, but then there's uh, another meta issue for um, oh, weird. How does that not come up? Um, let's see if I can get to it through there. Nope. Um, it's in the CE repo. Yeah, I guess in the C repo. Okay. So um so these are the okay. Um the uh there's a bunch of big ideas that I think are left um you know from the I2P scope. And most of them are related to DevOps. Um onboarding and adoption. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of areas there of it's actually a really big issue with lots of stuff Just really show quickly show you the list of things Lots of different ideas for how to improve onboarding how to get people actually using idea to production Improving auto deploy whatever not a lot of visuals. So I won't really talk about it, but it's definitely 
but one of our top priorities, the next most important thing we're working on. Um, cloud development is this idea that um, you, you know, setting up your local host machine is actually kind of a pain um, sometimes. If, if you switch between, especially with microservices, where like each service could be in their own language or whatever, like you don't have to want to maintain like Java and Ruby and Node and all these other versions of dependencies. And every time something switches, you got to reinstall a new version of stuff or, or whatever, you know, even just these days, it's you know, I'm developing on an iPad and I don't have a local host to compile things. Um, Cloud9 is sort of the biggest well-known um, thing from an IDE perspective and Amazon bought them a little while ago. But even aside from the IDE portion of it is just <clears throat> being able to develop in the cloud and uh, being able to make some changes and then push them back, you know, commit them to a repo. And we sort of have a, have a little bit of a demo like this right now with our web terminal. So if you're on Kubernetes, you can click this terminal button and it just pops up a terminal um, right in, um, I'll show you that if you haven't seen it. Um, yeah, here. So on the staging app, I just popped up terminal and I'm in the staging server. And I could actually go ahead and you know edit a file there. And um, heck, I'll show you all the way through. So and I just made a live change into my staging app. Now, generally speaking, I would not actually recommend you do that because I'm messing with my staging app. Um, that's not what this is for. It makes an awesome little demo, but it's you know it's not what you should do. Um, what we want to do is come up with a way where people could do that, but have it be not on your staging app, but in maybe a cloud environment or dev environment that is specifically for this purpose. Um, but that also lets after you make your changes and test them and run them live, you can then go and commit them back to version control and close that loop. So there's a whole bunch of issues um, related to that. Um, and you know, it, to be honest, it was what we were hoping that coding with a K um, would have provided for us. And we have um, you know, an integration with them, but it hasn't worked out nearly the way we had hoped. Um, and so we're looking at you know, alternatives and we think we can probably do this ourselves. Anyway. That's a big a big thing to, to flesh out. Ops features I just talked about, that's another big area of DevOps. There's, a, there's several more here, we go through them really quickly. GitLab paths, this is basically the idea that, um, you know, at some point, like Heroku is awesome because it gives you this really great platform that's easy to use and gives you all this functionality on top of Amazon and makes it, you know, and, Five or six years ago, it was like super, like brain melting, you know, awesome um, to get people to, to do ops and you know, do ops. And so, as a developer, I don't have to be aware of how to even do ops. Like, Ruby just does the ops for us. Um, and the idea here is that, like, you know, we've got a lot of these components and we're not going to invent them all from scratch. We're going to rely on Kubernetes, for example. But on top of Kubernetes, we could make an awesome environment, an awesome ops environment or a platform as a service. And so there's an issue there to discuss, you know, what it would take to do that. Um, I haven't bolded it because what I've done here is these three are the things that I want to work on a vision for right now. But just at some point in time, this is a big item for us. You know, if we can make it super really easy for you to, um, you know, just really fully manage your ops environment via GitLab and maybe like, for example, never touch the Kubernetes dashboard, never touch any other tools, just use GitLab tools to do this. That's pretty powerful. Um, sort of related uh, is actually an idea that's in the onboarding stuff, but the idea that uh, like on gitlab.com, we can actually provide you a Kubernetes cluster or maybe a shared cluster. You have to worry about the security and all this kind of thing. But imagine if you're a brand new user on, on gitlab.com and you push up an app and you have nothing in there specifically for GitLab, you just push up your code and we like, oh, that's a Ruby app. Okay, I know how to build up Ruby apps. Oh, and I also know how to test Ruby apps. So I'm just going to go and test them automatically for you. And oh, by the way, I know how to deploy this. So I'm just going to go ahead and deploy this to production. And we'll make a you know, production dot, you know, your project name dot, you know, ephemeral GitLab apps dot com, whatever the hell, some domain so that, you know, it's not going to affect your actual production. But if you wanted to, you would just point your DNS over to this production app and you've got 
your production app running on GitLab infrastructure. And you know, that's really what Heroku provided, right? Um, but that also is an onboarding thing that we just make it really easy because if we want it, if we want everybody to have CI, well, let's just turn it on for you. That's pretty awesome. But if we want everybody to have CD, we can't just turn it on for you because you have to have a place to deploy it too. So if we just provided you a Kubernetes cluster, everybody gets a cluster, then you've just got a place. Now maybe we'll severely limit it. You know, we'll make it you know, limited in some ways so that you know you're not going to run your production stuff for long there. Or if you do, you have to pay for it, whatever. But we also we don't we're not going to try and make money off of the production resources. We want to make money off of making it really easy. So really, what we want to do is encourage you to then go and spin up your own Kubernetes cluster, ideally on say Google. And we'll make a nice little link that says, go and spin up a cluster on GKE. We'll make that really, really easy. But to make it super easy for a first, you know, for some number of days, we can just provide you that cluster um, automatically. Uh, anyway, so uh, auto DevOps, um, we're going to talk about it in a bit. So I'm going to jump over. Feature flags, we just talked about briefly. Um, I feel like I might have talked about them last time. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just um, they're really about decoupling. Um, delivery from deployment. So the idea is you make your code, you deploy it, but you haven't turned it on, so it's not delivered yet. And, um, and the idea there is that it means you can merge in the mainline more often because it's not affecting anybody, but it also really uh, helps because you can do things like, when I do deliver, I can deliver it for certain people, like just GitLab employees or just the beta groups or whatever. And then I can control that. So then if the error rates spike or whatever, like, well, it's just a few people. I know who they are. They're going to complain to me. It's not a big deal. Um, but I can test things out, get it polished, fix the problems before rolling it out. And then you can also do things like roll it out to 10% of the people, 50% of the people, whatever. It's all about sort of reducing risk, improving quality, um, and fundamentally by getting things into your mainline quicker. So it's ops-ish in that sense. It's really still pretty fully on dev. Version checker I just showed you. Artifact management. Um, this has become a hot topic lately. Um, we already have a container registry for Docker image artifacts. And we also have um, file-based artifacts that you can pass between jobs and pass even between pipelines and uh, even pass between cross-project pipelines soon. Um, and we have ways to download them and browse them. but uh, if those artifacts happen to be things like you know, Maven or you know, Ruby or node modules that you want to then publish and release, or release and publish, depending on how you're it, and then consume in other pipelines, we don't have a formal way to do that. Um, and you can obviously publish to you know, the open source Ruby gems, for example. But if you want a private gem that is only consumed by your team, and you know, Ruby developers maybe don't do that as much, but Java developers do that all the time. Uh, a lot of Java developers use Artifactory or SonarCube, um, I forget what it's called, but whatever. Um, and so anyway, in order to complete this tool chain thing, uh, you know, the idea is that we need to have some first class support for that. And either by you know, bundling in one of these other providers or by just adding layers and APIs on top of our existing artifacts. You know, so my personal pet favorite right now is, um, you know, we already have artifacts, but let's say you can just tag those and say, oh, this is a Maven type of artifact. Um, and then we expose that via an API. And so then you can, you know, declare that in another project and it would just consume the APIs and we just know how to do that. But it would also use our built-in authentication. So you don't have to set up creds and, and do, do all this declaration. You can just be like, oh, I've got access to this project and this project so I can get the artifacts and I can just consume it all really, really easily. So those are uh, the high level things that I, I think are big ideas uh, for DevOps. So let's talk about auto DevOps then. Um, and this is, this is actually really spanning from the near term to the very long term. But the idea here is that it's great that we do a lot of DevOps. Sure. Um, and in a very simplistic way, it's like, oh, but shouldn't we just make this stuff automatic? Um, the way I'd phrase it as, you know, we should provide best practices in an easy and default way. So the idea is, like, you can, right now, you can set up a GitLab CI YAML, but you have to actively go and do that. But really, every project should be running some kind of CI. So why don't we just 
again, detect that you've pushed up a product, a project, sorry, and it's a certain kind of language, we'll just build it and we'll go and test it because we know how to do testing. And so today with auto deploy, we can already use auto build uh, with build packs. So this, the link is actually to our, our production stuff. This works. <clears throat> we will automatically detect, I think one of seven different languages and automatically build your Java app or your um, Ruby node. I forget what, maybe Go, I'm not sure which ones are in there. Um, and we use Heroku's build packs actually to do this build. Um, and so we build that up. And then if you know, again, you're using auto deploy, we'll go ahead and deploy that. And so that's again, pointing to actual documentation. This is a real thing. Um, <clears throat> you still have to obviously have a Kubernetes cluster in order to do that. So it's not fully automated if you don't have that. But if you've got Kubernetes, like, hey, this is a one click, one click to, to do it. I, could, well, I can't really show you right now. Um, <clears throat> but it's really easy. It's just literally one click. You pick from a menu, say, oh, I'm on Kubernetes, and then hit submit, and you've got auto deploy and auto build. But one of the things we don't have is auto CI. Um, and so that's a little annoying, but it's one of the things we want to pick up. And actually, hopefully, Dimitri, our CTO, Dimitri, is going to pick that up in Q3, put that as one of his OKRs. And looking at using Heroku themselves actually extended build packs to do testing. And so that means that there's at least five build packs that know how to test these languages. And so like, hey, let's use that to just automatically do that. But even if that doesn't work, there's a lot of other things we can do. Other companies have, um, have all this stuff automated as well. Um, so even if we can't use Heroku CI, you know, being able to say, oh, this is this language, we know how to test this language, making that automatic. And then, you know, again, either it's you know, automatic is, is multiple levels of things. It's like, is it a wizard that configures this stuff for me? Is it a one-click checkbox that says, yes, turn on auto CI? Or is it, you know, templates that I can easily add into my GitLab CI YAML? I think in order to qualify as auto, like part of the idea here is that it shouldn't be templates, it shouldn't be blog posts that tell me how to do it. That's just CI. It should be like literally just I pushed and it worked, or at most, you know, a checkbox or two. Um, and so the idea is then, all right, well, let's, let's go further. What other things can we just automate here? And not automate for, the, for strictly the purposes of automation, but about bringing best practices to people. So you have to actively work hard to turn these things off. If you don't want CI, it's right off as opposed to like, yeah, by default, you should have this. So, you know, this is a really, really long list of things that, you know, may take us forever to get to. The first ones have links because we're actually tracking, um, you know, more closely real, um, real issues for this. You know, auto metrics is a great one. Like if you're running certain languages, we should just be able to, you know, really easily go and just pull the right information out of there. Um, but, you know, whatever it goes on, the list is huge. Um, but the idea is that we can build up this auto DevOps, even a marketing term, and start talking about it in that way. And so, not just say that you know, GitLab is great for your DevOps and is a complete DevOps tool chain, but in fact, we do all the stuff for you automatically. Um, there's a lot to be done, you know, to make this fully automated. You know, and and what percentage of projects can we really do? Like auto deploy is a great example. Like that only works for web apps. It's not a web app. We can't just deploy it. Like, what would it mean? We deploy it, and like, it just wouldn't function. You know, if you if you made a, a command line app or whatever, like, what would deploying even mean? Um, or if it's again like a, a Maven, or really any kind of like module that you bundled up and released. Like, well, that's not the same thing as deploy. So you know, maybe we need an auto release. It's not on this list, but maybe it should be. Um, but within the web app space, we can. You know, do all, do some of this stuff automatically. So that's it. Everything you ever wanted to know about DevOps. Questions? None on um, none on my end. It's a lot to a lot to take in. I got the master all right now. Yeah. Mark, do you have like, so looking at this list on auto DevOps, I know you talked about, you know, some of them are sort of in process or in sort of thinking about designing, you know, do you have sort of a master plan in your mind as to sort of, you know, 
when this all gets built out and, and added into the platform? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think that the onboarding stuff that I talked about is our next most important thing to work on or the most important thing to work on next. And that will start touching on some of this auto DevOps stuff. Like ideally, I think one of the best ways we could auto onboard somebody is to just give them CI. And, may, and again, maybe we can't do auto deploy because you don't have Kubernetes, but we've got shared runners for free. So just turning on CI for every project, that would be pretty awesome. And so if we just auto built and auto, you know, auto CI, may, you know, that still might take a few months, but you know, that would be great. If we go further and add you know, Kubernetes or cluster built in or whatever, or just maybe you know, we can't automatically give you a cluster, but we make it really easy for you to create a cluster. And then once you've got a cluster, we can then turn on the rest of auto deploy and all and auto metrics and everything else. Um, that's all pretty, you know, medium term stuff. Uh, I did say that like cloud development, if I go back to, um, let's see how far back was it. Yeah, right here. Like these are the three things that I want to work on, you know, basically in order. Um, maybe I'll actually swap that order, frankly, as I look at it. I think I want to work on ops features before I work on cloud development. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said for going after the ops, the operator, uh, the ops person. Um, and, uh, and so, I, you know, I, I think that that's, that's a big chunk of stuff. And that would really make a big difference in fleshing out sort of the, the DevOps. Not auto DevOps, but just really focusing on DevOps. The rest of these things there, I really don't know. Um, I mean, some part of me feels like, oh my God, they're years away. And then some of me says, well, but when we decide to do them, we'll come up with something in a month and we'll ship it. And then three months later, we're gonna have a pretty good version. Um, so it really just kind of comes down to sort of what the priorities are. And um, it's too hard to play crystal ball on that of what, by the time we do these other things, you know, that could be three or maybe even six months of work, or whatever. You know, and even as I say that, like part of me is like, well, we could do one month of work in each one of these things and then circle back around. Um, and there's something to be said for that. But I just know that there's a bunch of stuff within onboarding and then a bunch of stuff within ops um, that could easily be a couple of releases each. So, yeah, um, I would have said, for example, if you if you'd asked me like that original diagram that I showed, you know, with that big scope, if you said, how long would that take? It's like a multi-year thing. I would have never predicted, frankly, that we would have shipped as much as we shipped in the year. Um, and that's, you know, a testament to our velocity, but also to focus and really, and really Sid having this massive, you know, great vision of, of delivering all this stuff and really pushing hard to deliver sort of minimal viable changes for each of these things and then adding to it later and, and believing in the, in the breadth. So now that we've identified that you know DevOps is part of our breadth and ops is part of our breadth, I just I can't see holding back. And, and ops features to me seems like the logical next thing um, after onboarding. Cool. Mark, I had a question. Um, I thought I can't remember if it was you that mentioned it or if I saw it somewhere else, but um, I thought we were going to have a license tracker for open source software. And would you include that in this whole kind of you know, macro, you know, big I2P areas of focus? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I called it version checker because that's, this issue actually is a flow that I wanted to demo out and it was very specific and it was about versions. Um, I think license checker is a little different in that um, you don't need to sort of proactively go and check every hour to see if the license has changed because for that matter, if you bundle it up and it's got a license, that license is the license. So license checker is more like when you do a new merge request and you add new dependencies, are those dependencies valid licenses? Like that's where you'd want to check it. And so it's more like just a job in your CICD pipeline that just checks for any new modules. If none, great. If there are new modules or new dependencies, then check the license of them. Um, but to do it right, like you don't necessarily want to do that manually in your job definition. So I, I could easily imagine wanting to automate some of this stuff or do periodically, you know, audit 
existing projects or things like that. So you'd want one big button that would say, go and, you know, check all my projects to see if they're compliant. Um, at any rate, it definitely is in the realm. Um, it's less DevOpsy again in the sense, but it's, um, it's not strictly about, you know, writing code and, and hosting it. Thanks. Um, Joe, any questions? I think I'm good for the moment. Thank you. Appreciate the overview. It was great. All right, cool. As so, I always, the, reserve the right to come back to you shortly. Of course, of course. Yeah, so one of the questions, sort of the immediate things we have, is this auto DevOps. And uh, it actually shows up in our OKRs currently. So, uh, from a product and marketing perspective, is you know, is this the term we want to go with? Is this a big thing we want to push for? If you want to push for that, how much product work needs to rally around this? And that may mean shuffling around our priorities a little bit to get to sort of a, a, a core thing that we're comfortable calling auto DevOps. Like clearly, I hope we don't have to have all of this before we call it auto DevOps. But if you say, oh, we've got the first five items, you know, then that's enough to call auto DevOps, but the first four isn't, in which case right, maybe that means, you know, we need to, shuffle some pri some priorities. I think things are actually lining up though, because again, Dimitri's gonna pick up auto CI. And so that's one of the big things, I think, from this perspective. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, we, we need to sort of circle around and talk about whether we wanna market it as such. If so, you know, how does that translate to products? And is it a feature, is it a product, or is it a white paper? I don't know, yeah. like, where yeah, does this fit? That's sort of that macro issue uh, is one of the top ones for me, you know, because we do we also have uh, a lot of terminology floating around, right? And so, I think getting consistency around, you know, how do we talk about these things? How are we, you know, how are we messaging them? So not only auto DevOps, but um, you know, all the different concepts that we have, um, you know, from conversational development, idea to production, you know, and so. Um, so yeah, anyways, one of the first orders of business. So um, yeah, got to figure out sort of how, how to tackle that, um, but expect to you know, work closely with you um, as we sort of ideate around that. Cool. All right, well, if there's nothing else, um, you got three more minutes back. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. All right, yeah, no problem. And of course, let me know if you have any questions. Will do. Thank you. Ciao.